Please tell me whether you can see it. Yes. Great. Let me just configure this load panel. Yeah. So um, here, uh, as you can see, is the like full title of this presentation, like the fantastic beasts and where to find them, the defable data source. And I don't know how many of you have used this type of data source or at least heard about it, but I'm curious to find out. So please put the plus sign in the comments section if you have already had some experience with it. Because honestly, I have bumped into this relatively recently. And yeah, I have missed its introduction in 2019 on dub.bc. But sometimes, some time ago, it got my attention and I tried it out just to see what it can do. And it turned out that this type of data source is a pretty cool thing. Yeah, so let me check the comment section. Oh, <laughs> minus, minus, oh, one plus. Okay, great. So uh, we have at least one person who had some heads on with the deepable data source. So this means that if I miss something, you can add that, or if you want, you can share your own experience. So great. Uh, now let's run quickly through the purpose of this presentation. So the usage of diffable data source is not so common as well-known ordinary data sources. Um, during iOS development, when we need to create some table or collection view, most of us will probably pick up the ordinary way of doing things like uh, number of sections, number of, so of rows in a section, so for at the index pass, without considering other alternatives, if any, right? And like with most of things, basically. But sometimes those alternatives could be more suitable for achieving our implementational goal. And sometimes those alternatives could be simply missed, like in my case, or they could have a pretty strange and complex name so that a lot of devs just slightly like afraid of it. And at the same time, because there is already an old and known approach, which also works. So the purpose of my presentation is not to convince you to use diffable variant of data source from now on. Like everything in software engineering, each approach has its advantages and disadvantages. So my main goal here is to show you what this alternative can provide so that in future, you can compare and choose the one that fits you the best. And because of this, I have next agenda. So firstly, we will find out what diffable data source really represents. Uh, then we will go through some code examples. And finally, I will sum up some key pros and cons of this type of data source. All right, so let's dive in. Yep, so diffable data source. Okay, so simply put, Diffable data source is a generic object which provides a special relationship between the controller layer and the UI layer. And it was introduced in iOS 13. It removes the need of having those three methods and querying your data every time to get that information. You just provide the data to it and the UI layer will automatically get every piece of information that it should know. But when you need to change the data source data, you just do the simple steps. I will describe and show them a bit later. And after that, you just apply that data to the data source and that's it. Diffable data source, as its name implies, is able to understand what was changed and to perform corresponding changes on UI automatically as well. And this can be done because it can work with the data that is unique. And yep, this is the requirement. Each section data and the row data must be hashable. This also gives an ability for the data to be queried very efficiently, so it can be treated as an advantage. And due to this, data source is considered to contain not the actual data, but identifiers. So in other words, your data will be represented as identifiers. And each, each identifier, like section or row, it is the unique piece of data that you have fed into that diffable data source previously. So it is still your data as you have designed it. So no worries here. And the way 
that you populate the default data source with your data and operate with it in the future is through something called a snapshot. A snapshot basically is the uh, source of truth of the current UI state. And it is also a generic object like the default data source itself. And it is parameterized on a section and item identifier types. Yep. And for the IS, we have two types of default data sources, one for table view and other is for the collection view. All right. So now let's check how it works in practice. Yeah, and here I have prepared a really simple uh, app, demo app, uh, which shows how ordinary data sources work in compared to the default ones. And I have made this for both the table view and the collection view. So let's start from the table view. Here we have like the table view with the ordinary data source and the default data source. So let's start from the first one. And here we have like a very simple table view. And it contains the data about the automobile models. So in the section we have like general model and each row contains a specific model information like uh, the model name, the year, and the horsepower. And I have a bunch of those in my table. You have BMW, Chevrolet, Dodge, like, et cetera. Yep. And at the top right corner, we have this edit button with which I can select multiple cells and delete them at once. So really straightforward functionality. Let's check now the diffable, the table view with the diffable data source. And well, basically everything looks the same. Here again, we have like the generic model in a section, the specific model in each row. We have a lot of those uh, automobile models here. And at the top right corner, again, the edit button with which I can delete like multiple cells. So visually and functionally, these two tables are the same. So now let's go through some code to understand how actually they differ. So yeah, let's start from this file. Here I have a base table view controller class. It will be basically the part for both the ordinary table view controller and the default table view controller. And it does just two things. Basically it, it uh, configures like general UI for those tables. And here we have like, uh, additional helper helper methods, and the second second thing is that uh, it can fetch and parse the data from the file, and basically that's it. So we will not stop here. We will move on. And at the top, I have these two structures, which basically represent my data model here. So this uh, table car info is my main structure. It has this uh, local property, which will represent my section. And this car specification array, which is typed as table car specification structure. Uh, it will be basically the array of my rows. And each row has like the model, the year, and the horsepower. And most of, and all of them are typed as a string. And here, as you can see, this structure conforms to the hashable protocol. I will go back to this when I will reach out to the default table view control. So let's start from the ordinary one. And here, all the things must be very familiar for all of you. The first item which we have here is the data model property, which will uh, handle all the data through the whole lifetime of this ordinary table view controller. And in the view did load with the usage of super class, I'm trying to uh, like retrieve the, the data from a corresponding file. After that, I have like a bunch of these uh, table view data source methods, like very known routine for us, number of sections, number of rows in the section. Here I have the cell for our index pass where I'm configuring this cell. And finally, I have this title for header in a section function just to be able to provide the value for each of my sections. So nothing new here, let's move on. And finally, I have these editing methods. So let's consider them in more detail. Uh, let's begin from this delete selected cells function. 
So this function gets called when I tap on this delete button. So what I'm doing here, the first thing I'm trying to grab the index passes for all selected rows. After that, I'm trying to sort them and to go through them in the reverse order. So that when I will remove a specific item from my data model property, I won't get into any trouble. And I believe everyone understands why I'm doing this, but if not, or someone just forget about this, uh, let's consider a simple example. Let's say that I want to uh, delete like these first three cells. So let's imagine that I'm not using the reverse function here. So when I tap on the delete button, I will receive like here, uh, the index passes will be sorted in the sorted order. So uh, the first index, which I want to remove from my data model property will be zero, like the Audi A3 here. And after that uh, first remove action, all the remaining items will update their indexes. So Audi E5, uh, after that action, will have instead of index one, index zero. Audi Q7, instead of index two, index one. But here, next index will be index number one. So instead of Audi A5, I will delete Audi Q7. And it will go on and on, depends on how many uh, like items I uh, selected here. So just to avoid that behavior, I'm using this reverse order. Yep. So after this, I'm trying to do basically the same, but for the UI representation of my data. Basically, I'm trying to delete the cells from my table view. After that, I'm trying to uh, find uh, whether there are some uh, empty sections left after like my previous actions. And if yes, I'm trying to do basically the same for them, like going through the, uh, going through them in reverse order and trying to remove them firstly from my data model property, and after that from my table view. Yep. And everything I'm doing in this perform batch updates function, like closure. And why I'm doing so? Well, uh, this is because I want to secure myself from uh, possible crashes in the future. Like, like um, let's say that uh, I or, I'm or uh, like some other person in some future will just move this line and put it like here. So, um, so that firstly, I will remove the UI representation of my data from table view. And only after that, I will update my data model prop. So, without this perform batch updates here, uh, things will go terribly wrong. And uh, yeah, let's, let's give it time to rebuild. And when I will execute some delete action, we will get, I guess, the pretty familiar for all of you, type of crash, like invalid update, invalid number of rows in a section zero. And this is because of inconsistency between the uh, data, which is at that moment uh, in the table view and between the data, which we have in the data model property. Because each time when we execute the delete rows function, the table view will be uh, like trying to uh, recalculate the amount of uh, available sections, the amount of uh, rows in that section. But at that time, uh, the data model property will not be updated because firstly, we will do this uh, update from the UI side. But with the perform batch updates usage, I can allow this to myself. So this time, everything will be working. Yeah, so uh, that's it for this function. Let's move on to this set editing function. And here I'm again using this perform batch updates uh, function with the nil object. And uh, this is for the reason, uh, like in my table, I have some rows which have like a pretty long uh, model name. 
So when I hit the edit button, as you can see, uh, those labels just uh, have, have increased the, the number of their lines. And because of this, the height of each cell has also increased, like with this smooth animation. And this is thanks to this perform batch updates with the nil object. This is basically the pretty neat way of uh, triggering recalculation of the height of each withable cell without triggering this reconfiguration of each withable cell. And yes, so uh, with the usage of this function here, like I don't have this UI bug when the label is just simply truncated. Yep, so the, this is it for the ordinary table view controller. Let's move on to the difficult one. And the first thing that you may notice here is that I'm not using the uh, data model property here. And this is because default data source provides this resilience for us. Yeah, it allows us to choose. Like uh, we have like two choices here. The first one is that we simply provide the data for uh, data to the default data source, and after that, it will like manage it for all the times. And when we want to uh, like. Uh, do some modification with the data, we just simply ask for the data from the default data source, execute our modification, and finally just apply that updated data to the default data source back. And that's it, like everything will be handled on the side of default data source. Basically, this is uh, those three simple steps about which I have started talk talking previously. And the second uh, choice here is to still use data model property along with the default data source. And this can be useful uh, when, for example, you have like uh, updates from the network of your uh, like updates for your data, which are executing too often so that you don't want to query the default data source like too often. Yep. And here, so here I have, chosen the uh, first way of doing the things. So the one and only property here is the default data source. And I'm trying to initialize this custom table view default data source instead of uh, like the bare default data source. So why I'm doing this? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is simply I can. And the second reason is that uh, this table view default data source itself inherits from the ordinary table view data source. So uh, basically, this means that we can override all the methods and functions of the ordinary table view uh, uh, data source of the ordinary one. And uh, like basically, this is not uh, desirable for us because default data source itself can manage all the things like in a good manner without our interaction. So we should not uh, like change the behavior of those functions. But still, we can uh, provide like I don't know some analytical stuff there. Uh, just to track, uh, for example, how uh, many of sections at that moment we have, but still trigger the uh, native default data source logic. So the second and the main reason why I'm doing this is because I need a way to provide the value for my sections. So because of this, I have overridden this title for header in section function. Yep. And here you can see that default data source is indeed the generic object. <clears throat> so uh, here we need to provide the section identifier type. Remember that my main uh, structure here, the first property is the logo, which represents my sections. So it is typed as a string. Remember string itself is the hashable type. So no complaints here from the default data source side. And the type for item identifiers. So the table car specification structure. Here it is. So uh, despite the fact that I'm using only uh, string properties here, I'm like forced to uh, say this explicitly, to say that this uh, custom 
type is the hashable one. But it is very easy to do. We just say this uh, hashable word here, and the Swift will do like all the things automatically beside, be, behind the scenes. So because of this, my table car specification type is the hashable one. And yeah, one note to here. Uh, one note here is that uh, let's say, for example, that in your case, you need to have like duplicates in your data. But remember, diffable data source can work only with the unique data. So how to overcome this issue? Well, quite easily, we need to just provide like additional property and use unique identifier and use this property as our hash value for the whole object. Uh, by doing so, we are each and every value in our data will be unique, despite the fact that the other part uh, of that data may be like may have like repetition. So just a little hint here. Yep, so let's go back to the initialization part. And here, first thing we need to provide our table view to the diffable data source. And this is done because the diff diffable data source should uh, like capture that table view and change its ordinary data source to basically itself. And along with that, we need to provide this closure, uh, logic of which uh, will normally go into the uh, cell for at index pass function. Like basically here, we need to configure our cell. But there is one difference between those two, like uh, the cell for at index pass function and this closure. In addition to table view and index pass, we receive like the specific item identifier. Basically, this is like a ready to go data for us so that we don't need to query our data model property here. We just use this specific, uh, the concrete item identifier and just use it to fill our cell with the information. And that's it. So this is a pretty cool way of doing things as for me. And in this view it load, uh, we still grabbing the data from the file with the usage of super object. And after that, we are trying to initialize the empty snapshot to fill our data source with the data. So firstly, we need to do this with the snapshot itself. So we are going through the uh, da uh, data model, like local data model property to fill uh, our snapshot with the Firstly, section. So here we are appending sections to this uh, snapshot. And after that, we are appending items to that section. Well, basically here I'm using this syntactical sugar because uh, initially this function looks like this. Like in addition to the items, we need to provide the specific section to which we want to append those items. But UIKit guys, again, provided us with this syntactical sugar so that when we uh, don't specify to which section we want to append those items, they will be appended to the last appended section, which basically works for our case here. And finally, we just will apply that uh, fillet snapshot to our data so a diffable data source. And that's it, basically these three parts, like the initialization with this closure, uh, the filling uh, snapshot with our data and applying it. And this like little guy here is enough to have this look of table view. And all the UI, all the rest of the stuff will be handled automatically by the default data source. So yeah, really neat way of creating the table view. All right, so now let's move on to this editing methods here also. And yeah, let's begin from this delete selected cells. So what I'm doing here, first thing, again, I'm trying to grab the index passes for all selected rows. And my next thing is, uh, okay, let's, let's pause here for a moment just to understand what is going on. So difficult data source and table view, they speak, let's say, in a different languages. So diffable data source uh, understand uh, item identifiers or section identifiers. 
but the table view understand index passes. And we need to have like a way to communicate these two between uh, each other. And the default data source provide us this way. So here I'm using it, the item identifier for index pass function, which will basically convert the specific index pass to a specific item identifier. So again, here I'm like converting all the selected index passes to uh, item identifiers, like each row, rows. And after that, I'm grabbing the current snapshot. Remember, this is the like representation of the current UI state, which we have at that moment in the table view. After that, I'm using this delete items function to remove them from that snapshot. Uh, next, I'm trying to find some empty sections and doing the same thing for them. And after that, I will just apply that updated sna snapshot. And that's it. Basically, the whole UI animation will be handled on, and on the default data source side. So here we don't need to uh, like carry about in which order I need to uh, remove the values from my data model property. I don't need to carry about in which, uh, like what should go first, uh, whether I need to firstly delete the uh, UI representation of the data or uh, the data from my data model property. Like those things are gone here. So we just simply do our work and the difficult data source will carry everything uh, in the right way. Yep. And when we will move to this setting editing function, here you have, uh, you can see this comment like which says uh, workaround. So yeah, here we have uh, like a little drawback. Uh, remember that uh, this table, like, like the table in the ordinary table view controller can have like cells which with the pre-long uh, model name. And here, when I tap on editing button, I still don't have that UI issue. Like the number of uh, label has increased and the number and the height of the cell has also increased. And this is because of this logic, basically these five lines, instead of remember only one perform batch updates with a new object. And uh, yeah, this is because we are not allowed to use perform batch updates along with the default data source. It is prohibited. If we will try to if we try to use it, uh, we will simply simply crash. Like that's it. And to overcome this issue, uh, I just needed to again grab the all visible rows at that moment, convert them to specific row uh, item identifiers, grab the current snapshot, use this reconfigure items function to like. Uh, retrigger this configuration of each visible cell. Yeah, not really efficient way, but still it will be done only for the visible cells. And finally, I will apply that updated snapshot. Uh, just to note here, I'm not sure, maybe uh, there are some better way of uh, resolving this issue, but I just simply couldn't find it. And uh, yeah, the perform batch updates will be like more suitable here. <laughs> I would say that. But still, we don't have that UI issue. And this is like not the like complex logic, just five lines and simple steps. But still, I would like to have here like perform batch updates. All right, so um, let's move on to the collection view. By the way, maybe some of you have some questions or I need to like pause for a moment at some part of the logic. So you are free to tell me. All right, if not, I will continue. So uh, collection views. Basically here I have used the same pattern as for the table views. I have this base collection view controller class, which again does uh, two things, configures the gen general UI like here and with help of this 
functions which uh, can provide the configured item, group, header, and section for my collection views. And the second and the last thing which it can do is that uh, it fetches and parses the data from the file. And that's it, nothing new here. And again, we have these two structures which represent my data model. So let's move on to the ordinary collection view controller. So again, very simple collection view and each item basically looks like uh, Excel, but it has uh, more information. Like in addition to the model name and the year, we have this classification of the transmission, the gears number, fuel type, and the horsepower. So yeah, and again, we have this view which represent the section, and we have a bunch of those like uh, automobile models here. Yeah. So. Uh, what we have in the ordinary variant, basically the well-known routine, data model property. Here we are again extracting the data and fetting it into the that data model property. For both the ordinary and diffable collection view, I'm using the compositional layout, just here to know. So here I need to provide the configured section. And finally, we have this UI collection view data source methods again number of sections, number of items in a section, cell for item at index pass, where I configure that item cell. And here I'm using this uh, view for supplementary element function just to provide that section view here. And that's it. Well, very, very known picture for all of us, I guess. So let's move on straight to the uh, diffable variant. Here again, the one and only property which I have is the data source. Here I'm using the bare UI collection view diffable data source. This is because the data source here, it has this supplementary view provider closure, which will uh, like create and put my section, like the supplementary view, which will represent my section. So I don't need to uh, inherit from the original diffable data source for collection view and to write some uh, data source map here. And again, uh, we are we need to provide the type for the uh, section and item identifiers and the logic which will configure our cell for each and every row. So nothing new here as well. In the view did load, I'm configuring the overall layout for collection view. So I won't stop here because it is not so important. But finally, here we have this complete data source configuration function. Let's check what it does. Uh, overall, for the uh, diffable data source for collection view, here I would like to show you two things, basically two features which a diffable data source can provide for the UI collection view only for it. So let's keep the first item, which we have also, uh, already reviewed. Here, I'm again trying to extract the data from the file. And the first feature here is that uh, this an as diffable data source section snapshot. And this object can provide us uh, the ability to construct our item identifiers in a hierarchical way so that we can end up with, let's say, a small section in the whole section, like in general one. So uh, here you may notice that it is typed with the item identifier type. And uh, here we have like initialization logic, but uh, please don't worry. It is still that compact, only two lines. Okay, like four lines, one here and additional line here just to cover all the cases. But overall, it is still two lines. This way of initializing is uh, again, very compact. The whole other part of the logic is just preparational one. So that this hierarchical feature, I want to apply only for the first section, just for demo purposes. So here I'm trying to find the duplicates 
uh, in my data, but not the like whole duplicates, but the duplicates which uh, by this I mean uh, the elements which have the same model name, like they may they may be uh, like uh, several Audi A3s, but the year will differ so that each and every value in my data is still unique. So no worries. So I want to find those duplicates. After that, I'm I will try to sort them. And uh, finally, I will go through them so that I will grab the corresponding item, which uh, will represent the array of those duplicates. Then I will try to remove the first element from that duplicate array and will use that first item and make it like the parent item. And after that, I will append all the remaining items in that array to that parent item. So, so that I will create this like hierarchical uh, structure. So the parent and the child elements in it. And finally, I will just apply that snapshot. So yeah, let's see how it looks uh, in practice. So let's say I have here this Audi A3 cell. So when I tap on it, and here we have the like the child elements of that parent item. Yeah, and I can collapse and expand them. All right, so let's see how this expand and collapse functionality was implemented. So for this, I have used this should selected item uh, function. So here I'm trying firstly to check uh, whether the tapped item is within the first section. After that, I'm trying to grab that first section. Basically, it will be this Audi value. Then I'm trying to get this snapshot of that whole Audi section. Then I'm trying to get again the chosen item, the tap, uh, the tapped item. So it will be like this Audi A3. And uh, I will try to get the snapshot of that item. Basically, this part of the data from the whole Audi snapshot. After that, I will try to verify whether this part of data has some items. If yes, I will check whether they were already expanded. Again, if yes, I will collapse them. And if no, I will expand them. And after that, I will just apply the updated look of the Audi section to the value so that the default data source can understand to which section we need to apply this updated look. And yeah, here we go. The hierarchical uh, structure, which can expand and collapse the child items. But still, uh, we, we could even uh, like avoid this part of logic if we used not the bare compositional layout here for our collection view, but the compositional layout with the list style, basically, which uh, this function can provide us with. So with the usage of this uh, list style, and in addition with the usage, not the bear or the custom collection view cell, but with the collection table view cell, which we could configure with the accessory value, which in turn should be a chevron, like remember that little right arrow. So uh, with the usage of that chevron, we could, get automatically that part of logic out of the box. So when we will tap on that chevron, like uh, that parent item will either expand or collapse. But if you want to have this uh, type of behavior when you tap on the whole cell, like at each and every point here, you need to have this code in this function. Yeah. So this that was the first feature which I wanted to show you. And the second feature, as you can read through this comment, it will be reordering. So when I uncomment this single line and we run the project, I will get the reordering functionality like for free. So with it, I can easily move my items in each and every place that I want. And if some item will be in the expanded state before the reordering, it will collapse. So yeah, this is pretty neat. And this is done because of these, uh, the usage of this reordering handlers property. Let's check it. 
So this reordering handlers property is typed as reordering handler structure, basically this one. And this structure has several like uh, properties. Uh, and in other words, they are closures. And each that closure is called on a specific uh, action. Here we have like can reorder item, will reorder and did reorder item. And with the usage of those, we can control our reordering uh, behavior. And in addition to this, uh, difficult data source for collection view, it has uh, this property, section snapshot for handlers. And it is also typed as the structure, but now uh, as this one, section snapshot handlers. And here it also has some uh, closure properties like should expand item, will expand, should collapse, will collapse. And this snapshot for expanding parent uh, closure, it can provide us with the more detailed information about uh, what just has happened during this uh, expand or collapse uh, activity. So with using of those, we can also uh, control the expand and collapse functionality. So yeah, this is very cool stuff to have. And yep, these two are available uh, from the iOS 14 and above. Yeah, so this is all for the demo. Now let's sum up some advantages and disadvantages of the default data source after we have seen how it works. So uh, let's start from the advantages. And the first one is that default data source allow us to avoid uh, holding the data in the local data model property. And secondly, its implementation can occupy less space. So basically you don't need to implement the standard data source methods. Well, yeah, you still have to write like an equivalent code to create your cell and to configure it. But remember the diffable variant, it has already ready, like ready to go data for you so that you don't need to query your data model property, which is very convenient. Next, uh, the data can be modified very easily with just three steps. Like the first one is to uh, create or grab the current snapshot. Uh, the second is to populate or change it. And finally, just apply it to the default data source. And that's it. All the rest of the stuff will be handled by the default data source automatically. And also it provides some pretty cool features for UI collection view as uh, reordering and this hierarchical structure of item identifiers. But this default data source also has some drawbacks. And the first one is that we cannot use perform batch updates. Well, overall, it is not really needed there, but still, as you have seen in my example, it would be more preferable there. And finally, like sometimes we need to communicate between the default data source and table view. And remember those two like speak on different languages, like uh, default data source understands uh, identifiers, table view understand index passes. Well, uh, yeah, default data source provides methods to overcome this, but still it adds some work, additional work. Well, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have some questions, comments, or suggestions, like feel free to provide them. I just want to add that your presentation was well structured and I enjoy it this talk so yeah guys if someone have any questions please be active